Have you ever seen an MMA fight and questioned if one of the fighters wanted to be in the cage? Either that or looked at them and wondered if they even knew what they were letting themselves in for. Aside from there most definitely being levels to the sport and occasionally people overestimating their abilities, some fighters have been happy to put themselves on the losing side of a contest for the sake of money, exposure or even honour. I'd never want to question any fighter's belief in themselves to come out on top, but at times we've seen matchups destined to be so one-sided you can't help but wonder if any trash talk before the fight is delusional or they are simply trying to stack the mountain of cash they're about to exchange for an ass whooping even higher. I'm Balian from MMA On Point and UFC 269 is inbound, so come join the fun with Bet Online, the official partners to MMA On Point. Feeling confident about the fights? Well, during our live UFC 269 fight companion this Saturday, featuring UFC featherweight prospect Lerone Murphy and actor extraordinaire Blake Harrison, you can play along with us using the code On Point to get a 50% sign-up bonus good to $1,000. More on that later, but for now, here are 10 times fighters knew they'd lose and did it anyway. Number 10. Ally Quinta versus Habib Namagamadoff. As Tommy pointed out at Thanksgiving, we no longer have to cross our fingers every time Habib and Tony Ferguson are matched up. Sadly, that ship has sailed, but it did on occasion lead to some interesting moments in MMA history, like the fight week of UFC 223 where, well, all hell broke loose, basically. For the fourth time Tony vs Habib had been booked, Conor was going to be stripped of his lightweight title and the winner of this long-awaited matchup would become the 155 champion and all would be right in the world again. But no, 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 Tony tripped over some cables during fight week, so it was off. None other than Max Holloway stepped up should be a good contest, but on weigh in day, he was deemed medically unfit to compete. Paul Felder did make 155, but the New York Athletic Commission said no, so it fell to the only other 55 around Al Iaquinta. Now, I'm sure Al will tell you he believed in himself going into the fight. I mean, hell, the card was on the anniversary of his coach's biggest upset in history when he KO'd GSP, but he had to know the odds were severely stacked against him. Habib had been on such a dominant streak and had trained for the most important fight of his life. Al didn't even make the weight. He called it an opportunity of a lifetime, and surely it was. He also acknowledged he had nothing to lose, but didn't exactly fight like that and was controlled by Habib on the feet and on the mat. Still, he went the distance with the eagle and had high praise. Yeah, Quinta is real gangster. Number 9. Chael vs. John Jones the promotional prowess of Mr. Sonnen was as evident in his rise to title contender as it is today with his continued growth on YouTube and other platforms. Gifted with the gab, he used his loquacious abilities for evil as the bad guy, providing a heel to the well, slightly innocent persona of Anderson Silva. And as soon as he was done with that escapade, he looked to capitalize on his profile while it still remained on top of the pile. And sensing the lackluster nature of the 205 pound division, and of course also conveniently being able to make the weight class, he set his sights on John Jones in a campaign for a title shot. When his teammate Dan Henderson fell out of UFC 151, he offered to step up on short notice and fight Jones, who showed a lack of interest in the fight and also expected foul play and possibly a setup. This gave Sonnen all the fuel he needed to push a rivalry. Conveniently enough, the Ultimate Fighter hadn't been doing well recently. They were down from 4 million views to just under 1, and a good rivalry would of course help boost the product. Jones considered it easy work. He agreed to coach opposite Chael in what turned out to be a pretty good damn season of tough. So despite coming off the back of a loss, Chael had talked himself into another chance at UFC Gold. All he had to do now was win the fight. Yeah, about that. Some sports books had Jones as high as a minus 940 favorite, given that Sonnen's only route to success would be to take down a man who's uh, never been taken down before and up a weight class, no less. Jones pretty much just big brothered him, controlling him with relative ease and landing ground and pound from top position until the finish. Maybe Chael knew he wouldn't win the fight, but he certainly made bank though. Number eight, Kavanaugh versus Cyborg. At this point, I think we've proven that the only woman on the planet who could beat Cyborg in an MMA fight is the second generation version of herself that is currently reigning over two divisions in the UFC. But after her own departure from the organization and jump to Bellator, she's picked up another four finishes as well, mainly women who didn't really have much of a chance. Most recently, Sinead Kavanaugh, who was, yes, on a two-fight win streak, but only seven and four in her career that began after Cyborg claimed her sixth championship win. And yeah, since that, she's had six more. Yes, I know, at 145 pounds, there aren't many choices available outside of Kayla Harrison and Nunez, who each dominate in their own respective promotions, although Kayla did make a cheeky appearance cage side for Bellator 271, where this fight took place. It went down as predicted, Cyborg blitzed her for 90 seconds, and although she came back swinging, eventually couldn't take any more and collapsed to the canvas. Obviously, when the champion is a minus 3,000 favorite, it says something about the state of your division, but also about the dominance of Chris Cyborg, who has once again looked unbeatable. Kavanaugh posted on Instagram about keeping her a word on fighting to the death, win, lose, or draw, and Cyborg was grateful for a good old-fashioned slugfest. They gotta sort out women's 145 across the board, though. Number 7. Fujita vs. Fedor 
In his first couple of Pride fights, Fader was a bit of an underdog. He was relatively unknown and as such, when facing off against the likes of Semi Shilt, he wasn't expected to come out on top. But after he beat Nagara and claimed the heavyweight title he would never lose, he pretty much became invincible. And after arguably his toughest opponent, he received, well, one of his easiest, at least on paper, as Pride pitted him against 9-3 veteran Kazuyuki Fujita, who, although had beaten some big names, had done so after enduring a relentless amount of punishment. And as such, the Japanese fans treated Fujita like a hero for this one, knowing full well he was walking into the lion's den with Fedor at a minus 1,100 favorite. Stephen Quadros even commentated as they touched gloves if that would be the only punch Vegeta would land tonight, he had that little faith in him. But it most definitely wasn't the only punch as for the first time in his career, Fedor was really made to do the chicken dance after a clubbing hook from Vegeta who scored a takedown and the crowd began chanting his name. As described by Quadros, a win for Vegeta would turn the heavyweight division on its axis but Fedor began teeing off and despite the iron head of old Vegeta, dropped and was submitted. For a second there, no one really knew what to say after Fedor began wobbling and the oh my god scream from the commentary team sums it up perfectly. It doesn't change the outcome of the fight, however, which ultimately went as everyone expected. Number 6. Fabio Maldonado vs Stipe Miocic in what was an all-Brazilian stacked card, Stipe Miocic was supposed to take on legend Junior Dos Santos in an epic clash for heavyweight divisional dominance at the Brazil Tough 3 finale. It was actually supposed to be at UFC 179, but the fight was pushed back. But four weeks before the event, JDS pulled out with a hand injury. Still, I'm sure the UFC had plenty of heavyweights to choose from to fill in. Mm, none at all? Well, how about a 205er then? We were in Brazil, so fellow countryman Fabio Maldonado seemed like a good choice. Only he was relatively small for even that division. This fight was on pretty short notice and aside from his boxing credentials, had little else to bring to the table, four and three so far in his UFC run. I mean, Stipe had already proved he was ready for a step up in competition and to face the division's best, we knew he could be a future champion and after Fabio appeared as a plus 559 underdog, it seemed most of the sports world agreed. And we weren't exactly sure what we would see, but it couldn't have been a more dominant performance from Stipe, who did indeed make it look like Maldonado didn't belong in the cage with him, running through him in 35 seconds and yeah, not exactly pleasing the home crowd. Still, no mercy was shown to the challenger, who earned a ton of respect from the community for stepping up on short notice and continued to test himself, even putting a beating on Fedor two years later. Number 5. Patrick Cummins vs Daniel Cormier most fighters don't talk about what goes on behind closed doors in the training room, but considering how much Patrick Cummins went on about how he broke Daniel Cormier during a wrestling practice and was happy enough to tell MMA media about it, you expect that would have been the narrative going into the fight. Cummins was filling in for Rashad Evans at UFC 170 and had been working as a barista in a coffee shop when he got the call. Cheers! The motherfucking... During fight week, he let the public know that he'd pushed DC to tears when preparing for the Olympics, but uh, according to the head coach of the team at the time, DC's breakdown was caused when he refused to let Daniel try again immediately after his loss in training to Patrick. He was trying to simulate the Olympics, and when he told DC, that's it, they're over for you, go home, he stormed off the mat in tears. DC also told media later that Patrick knew he was having trouble in his personal life around this time as well, following the death of his daughter, and for Cummings to bring that up wasn't the kind of behavior he remembered from the pack he knew back then. I mean, it was a pretty dick move. Go f Especially when they had actually wrestled in competition, DC had beat him 7-0. and oh. The point is, yeah, it was pretty delusional of Pat to think he had a chance against DC. I mean, Cormier was 14-0, and dominated the heavyweight Grand Prix in Strikeforce, and annihilated everyone he faced in the UFC while you've yet to even make your UFC debut and uh, work in a coffee shop. But of course, when you're making your debut, it helps to generate as much media attention as possible, and he had certainly done that before he was sat down in the first round in a fight he was never really in. But hey, he stayed fighting in the promotion for another five years, even getting a win over future champion Jan Blakovich. Number four, Min Su Kim versus Brock Lesnar. Like most people as a child, I thought professional wrestlers were the most superhuman people on earth. Until that kid at school told you it was fake, you tried to DDT him and ended up getting your shit pushed in. Big time! <laughs> Still, ever since someone had shown me that fighting is a sport now, I'd always wondered how those WWE dudes who can launch huge people through the air might actually fare. Of course, we all eventually got to see what happened across Brock Lesnar's career, but when he first announced he would be trying his hand at MMA, there was a lot of interest from the fan base just to see how one of the biggest human beings on earth would actually look in a fist fight. But you see, Brock was also a US Division 1 national champion, pretty much the pinnacle of collegiate wrestling, and that was at 285 pounds. That combined with his monstrous figure and yeah, it was 
definitely someone to be taken seriously. He was supposed to be taking on fellow giant Honman Choi, which probably would have been the greatest freak show fight of all time, but 10 days before, he unfortunately pulled out of the bout due to a tumor and up stepped Min Soo Kim, a 2 and 5 judoka from the Heroes promotion, who'd already been KO'd twice in the last year. So, uh, yeah, no one expected much from Kim. The promoters, probably knowing full well no one would watch the event otherwise, continued to promote it as Lesnar versus Troy right up until the day of the event, even though the card itself also contained a rematch between Hoist Gracie and Kazushi Sakuraba. Kim himself also stated he had an eye injury going into the fight. He was immediately taken down after throwing a pretty terrible leg kick where Lesnar sat on him and didn't even have time to posture up before Kim was tapping. Yeah, well, the dude only got 30 grand for this fight, so I don't know what you expect. Number three, Dan Hooker versus Islam Mahachev. Dan Hooker had been desperate to take a fight towards the closing of 2021, especially after an unsuccessful year, and given the lottery system built around New Zealand's COVID restriction, he had barely managed to make it to UFC 266, landing just 48 hours before the fight, making weight and getting the win. It was announced, however, that Rafael Dos Anjos was out of this fight at the upcoming 267 pay-per-view against Islam Mahachev, the division's next top prospect. I want to help him retire it now. A big protege and definitely someone you need a full training camp to prepare for. Despite being asked by the Mac Life's Oscar Willis how he'd feel about a short notice replacement and telling him no, it was announced that instead of suffering through the process of returning to New Zealand and waiting out another lottery, he would be jumping on a plane to Abu Dhabi in what some called a Mass Effect 2 final mission to take on the Dagestanian prospect. Of course, he was compensated accordingly, but apparently his only request was for clothes, seeing as he didn't have any now that he had to spend another 30 days in Vegas preparing for the fight. Other fighters in the division weren't taking this fight with the promise of six weeks to prepare for it, but Hooker faced him regardless and eventually tweeted this gift after the loss which came as most predicted in just over two minutes as he was taken down and submitted by the Russian. Number two, Tamora versus Bob Sapp. I didn't know they made people as big as they do until I first saw Bob Sapp compete in Pride. If he'd been a gladiator, he'd been the guy that they threw all the really worst prisoners to. Scum of the earth types and an armor-clad Sapp would have had no trouble turning into paste. At least that's how his career in MMA started. Always a fan of the spectacle, Bob found himself in several open weight contests just so we could definitely be sure what a height, weight, and muscle advantage often looks like. His Pride debut against Yamamoto attracted 10 million viewers and it propelled him to a kickboxing bout a month later where he was described qualified for throwing his opponent to the ground and raining down illegal strikes. He had become an overnight sensation and fans were keen to see more destruction. Despite being viciously KO'd by Vandalay Silva four months earlier in another fight that probably could have made this list, Kiyoshi Tamura signed up to take on the newcomer Sap. To be fair to him, he was a two-time rings openweight champion and also had wins over legit competition. It's just none of those previous fighters outweighed him by 150 pounds. And although I'm sure Tamura was up to the challenge, having seen what Sap was capable of and the trajectory he had appeared to be heading, well, he was basically just a stepping stone. Bob wasted no time ending the fight in 11 seconds, living up to all the hype he had built for himself. Number one, Yumiko Hota versus Gabby Garcia. If you want to see a ton of gold, go scroll through Gabby Garcia's Wikipedia page, as she's been smashing BJJ tournaments across the globe for the last 13 years and in 2015 made the move to MMA. If you don't know anything about Gabby, she competes in the 160 pound plus division of Jiu Jitsu and in her MMA contest has generally fought around the 200 pound mark. And that was a damn sight more than her opponent at the New Year's Rise in 4 Grand Prix card, where after her rival Shinobi Kandori fell out, who was also 50 by the way, was replaced with Yumiko Hota, who for some reason on short notice decided it was a good idea to step up and fight quite possibly one of the most intimidating female athletes of all time. Now, to be fair, she had fought in MMA previously, actually as far back as 1995, but at the same time, I mean, she was a grandma by this point and was about 100 pounds lighter than Gabby. And instead of taking her down like a jujitsu artist might do, she instead put a beating on her with knees to the head, punches and ground and pound. It all just seemed a bit unnecessary, really. Gabby had proved nothing, and although it was certainly in keeping with the warrior spirit, for Hota, unless she thought the fight was fake, there is no way in hell she could have won this contest. Thanks again to our official partners, Bet Online. Make sure to come and join us for our live UFC 269 in studio fight companion this Saturday, featuring UFC featherweight prospect Lerone Murphy and actor extraordinaire Blake Harrison. You can play along with us at betonline.ag using the code ONPOINT to get a 50% sign up bonus good for up to $1,000. See you Saturday, fight fans. A big shout out to Luke Taylor for editing this video. You can find him and some of his amazing artwork on Twitter at cool2me underscore. 
Shout out to Ben Rosette and the excellent music he provided during the intro video. His music can be found on streaming platforms everywhere. There is a link in the description and follow him at Ben Rosette on Instagram and on Twitter. Thanks so much for watching today, guys. Remember to like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.